All right, how to use JavaScript promises. So JavaScript promises represent an alternative system for managing asynchronous requests in your code base. And when I say alternative, I mean an alternative to callbacks. If you've written any JavaScript code in the past, you've definitely used a callback function before. Something like this jQuery Ajax function. You know, a user clicks on a button, you make an asynchronous call to the server to fetch data, and then you have a callback function as a success handler that runs once the data comes back. And you do some sort of logic on that data, most likely updating a UI. And callbacks work great when your logic is as simple as like make one request, get one result, do one thing. But in the real world, async is much more convoluted than that. You'll be making multiple requests simultaneously, and the UI logic might be different depending on which one of those requests returns first. Or you might want to have the logic on how to call the API server in a different part of your code base from the logic of what to do with the data once it returns. And promises just make it easier to manage multiple async requests, and they make your code base significantly cleaner when you have real world applications. The only trade-off is that it might just be a little bit more confusing at first to wrap your head around the concept of promises. But once you get it, it makes perfect sense and you'll be using promises in your JavaScript code for the rest of your life. Okay, so just to clarify, promises are a design pattern. This is not to be confused with a promise library. Promise libraries are specific implementations of the promise design pattern. So things like Q or things like Bluebird, these are promise libraries. These are actual implementations of just a design pattern. But there's also now a native implementation of promises in JavaScript itself. So you can use the promise design pattern without needing to include any external libraries or frameworks whatsoever. Okay, at a high level, there's only two concepts that you really need to wrap your head around for this to all make sense to you. The deferred object and the promise object. You can think of the promise object a little bit like a progress bar. It's kind of hard to understand because it's a physical representation of an intangible concept. It's just this idea of something that's currently in progress and it's personified as a JavaScript object. You know, the task might not have finished yet, and you might not have access to the data to run an operation on, but you want a reference to that in-progress task itself so that you can write logic around it. You know, an example of this would be like, I want to run three separate tasks and then aggregate the results when all three come back and then do something with that data, even though the tasks might finish at different times. And, and that's kind of a hard concept to represent in the callback model because you don't have access to that in-progress object but you know, if you did, you could write that logic a little bit easier where it's like, I want these three in progress objects and when they all finish, I wanna do something with it. So if the, prog if, if the promise object is a progress bar, the deferred object is like an interface into that progress bar. So you don't actually like make updates to that progress bar directly, you update it through this deferred object which serves as its interface. And I know that's like kind of a really crude example right now, but I guarantee you that this will make sense as we keep going. So as we get into the, the rest of this screencast, I just wanna say like, just my, my advice would be to just power through watching it once and then go back to the beginning and watch it again. Cause this stuff will make sense, more and more sense as you go. So just, if, if something isn't making sense, just keep watching and I think it'll start to dawn on you. And then if you go back and watch it again, it'll all make sense. Okay, we start with a deferred object. The deferred object is just a JavaScript object, but it has a property on it called promise, which is the promise object. Now these are two separate objects. You can pass the deferred and the promise into separate functions and operate on them independently. But you can always get to the promise from the deferred object because it's just a property on it. You can call deferred.promise and get to the promise at any time. Now the promise has two properties on it itself. It has a status and a value. By default, when you create a promise, the status is pending and the value is undefined. Now let's stop right there for a second and see what this looks like in actual JavaScript code. Okay, so I'm not using any libraries or frameworks or anything like that. This is just the JavaScript console in the Chrome browser. If I want to create a new deferred object, I can just say var deferred equals promise dot defer. And that creates a new deferred object. If I look at it in the console, I can see that it has an attribute on it called promise. If I want to isolate the promise, I can set a separate variable equal to deferred dot promise. 
And if I look at that, I can see that it has a status of pending and a value of undefined. Now, just to again confirm, that promise object is the exact same promise object as the property on the deferred object. So in addition to having a property of promise, the deferred object also has two functions that you can call, resolve and reject. And in addition to having two properties, the promise object has two functions that you can call, then and catch. Now, the good news is that this is the end of the chart. If you can understand what these functions do, you will understand promises no problem. So what does the resolve function do? Well, if you think of the promise as a progress bar, the resolve function is saying this is no longer in progress. It has completed. We have finished and gotten a value from our calculation. So it's going to tell everyone that was referencing that progress bar, hey, we, you're, it's not in progress anymore. We have the value. You can go ahead with the rest of your execution of your function. So when we resolve a promise, we resolve it with a value. And that becomes the value of the promise. And then any function waiting for that value now uses that value to continue its execution. So we resolve a promise with a value. It can be any JavaScript value. Let's use an example, a number for simplicity. I just randomly chose the number 17. So in this hypothetical example, we resolve a promise with the number 17. And look at what happens. It severs its connection to the reject function. So if I called reject on a deferred object after it's been resolved, nothing will happen. Now, after I resolve a promise, the promise updates its status to resolved, and it will update its value to 17, the value I resolved it with. This will also trigger the then function to anyone that had been referencing the promise. And it will trigger that function with the argument of the promise's value passed in. It will also sever its connection to the catch function. So let's stop there for a second and take a look at what this looks like in code. OK, so I have my deferred object from before. And if we expand it out, we can see not only does it have that property of promise, it also has two functions, reject and resolve. And I still have my promise object from before, which status is pending and value is undefined. So let's attach a listener to it. Let's do promise.then takes one argument, which is the value the promise will be resolved with. And let's just console.log value times 10. And if I hit enter, notice that nothing happens because this function hasn't been triggered yet. This function is only going to be triggered once the promise is resolved. And you resolve a promise from the deferred object. So let's do deferred.resolve with the value of 17. And notice that our function was triggered. It console.log that value times 10 to 170. And if we look at the promise, we can see that its status has now been resolved and its value is 17. So we resolved a promise with a value and went down the green branches. But if for some reason we get an error in our asynchronous request, we can go down the red branches instead and we can reject the promise. Now, when you reject a promise, you, you can pass in any value you want, but normally you pass in a JavaScript error object. So let's say something went wrong, with our server was down or something. We choose to reject this promise with a 404 error. Now, look what happens. The resolve branch is severed. So if you reject a promise, you can no longer ever resolve that promise. It's gone for it's rejected for good. The, the status of the promise updates to rejected, the value becomes that error object, and we go down the catch branch and we pass the error object in. So anything downstream that was listening on the dot then function knows, hey, this promise errored out, don't execute that then function, you can catch this error and handle it. So let's look at that in code. Okay, so let's make another deferred object, promise.defer. And let's make another promise object, deferred.promise. Now, let's attach a then function to this promise that does exactly what we did before. We'll just console.log value times 10. But we'll also attach a catch function, catch error. And we'll just console.log promise uh, caught an error and we'll log the error message also. So we've attached a then listener, a catch listener. So far, nothing's happened because the promise is still pending. But instead of resolving it with 17, let's reject it this time with a new error. And we'll just add the message, something went wrong. Now, if I hit Enter, notice that promise caught an error, something went wrong. So the catch function fired. But this dot then console logging value times 10, 
this this never fired. So as fun as it is to look at my awesome keynotes, it's probably a little bit more valuable to see what this actually looks like in code. So this is just gonna be pseudocode right here, but you might do something like this in an actual code base. So uh, on my left-hand side, we have some sort of UI domain logic. Uh, and on my right-hand side, we have some sort of API service. So we might make a class here that's called API service. And it might have some function called get data that takes an endpoint as an argument. And watch what we do here. We're gonna make a deferred object, promise.defer. And then we're gonna return the deferred.promise from this function. And we will come back to this. And we might do module.exports equals new API service so that we can use this in other files. Now, in our domain logic, we might get a reference to that API service. And we might make a function called load data that takes an endpoint. And we might do something like this, where we call the API service dot get data endpoint. And remember, this function now returns a promise. So we can just call dot then on it with the data that gets returned. And we can do something with this data. And if it returns an error, we can catch the error, and we can handle it. And then we'd call like load data, and we'd pass it some endpoint. So let's go back to here. Um, the way that this would normally work is you'd do something like call fetch, which is the JavaScript function that makes HTTP requests. You would give it the endpoint and some sort of fetch config, which we haven't defined, but whatever. And fetch actually itself returns a promise. So you would do dot then as data, and you'd use the result of that promise to then uh, resolve the promise that you had created uh, beforehand. So let's look at this code right here. Um, we're making a deferred object in the API service. We return the promise and then make some async call, and we wait for it to resolve. And then in our UI logic, all that we're saying is go get data from the endpoint, and when you have the data back, go do something with it. Then this resolves, this then function gets triggered. But we have really good isolation here because our domain logic on our left-hand side, it, it doesn't, it's not concerned with how the API is implemented. It just says call out to the API, get the data back, and then do some sort of domain UI thing. And on the right-hand side, we have really good isolation because the API service isn't concerned about what's happening with the data. It's just concerned about how we can you know, go to the API, get the data, and it just returns a promise, and anyone that wants to hook into it can. So I mentioned beforehand that promises give you a lot more leverage over managing multiple asynchronous API calls. And I want to give you some examples of how that might work to give you a little bit more color on why promises are so valuable. So let's look at this scenario where we have an Instagram post. Uh, this is a uh, self-driving car flipped over in the Tenderloin District of San Francisco. I'm just kidding. I don't know if it's actually a self-driving car, but it definitely sums up my experience in the Tenderloin. Um, but anyway, in order to generate this image, we might be getting the picture itself from one API source. We might be getting the username and the user profile picture from another. And we might be getting the like count and the usernames that like the picture from a separate API source. But we don't want to render this actual post until we have data from all three sources because we don't want to render a partial view. So we have kind of this scenario where we want to reach out to multiple different APIs and we want to aggregate the data together and wait for it all to be back before we update the user interface. So I'm going to create three separate deferred objects, and then I'm going to go ahead and create three separate promise objects as well. Now I'm going to use the promise.all function, which takes an array of multiple promises and then only fires the then function if and only if all promises in the array have been resolved. So I'll give it p1, p2, p3, and then I'll give it a then function, and it'll take the values. So it takes an array of what the values will be when they've all been resolved. And let's just sum this array uh, as an example. So reduce memo i uh, return memo plus i. And let's go ahead and resolve the first resol resolve the first deferred object. I'll give it the number 10. And notice that nothing happens. I'll resolve the second deferred object, the number 15. Again, nothing happens. But now I'm going to resolve the third deferred object, which means all three promises should be resolved. I'll resolve with the number 25, so this should sum to 50. And sure enough, when I hit enter, we get 50. So uh, all three of the deferred objects have been resolved, all the promises have been resolved, fires off the, the function, sums the array, gives us 50.
And now remember, since our API service returns a promise, if we wanted to implement this in code, we could do something like this. Promise.all, make this endpoint one, put that there. We could do API service dot get data endpoint two, comma, API service dot get data endpoint three, and then just put the dot then on the values here. Values, do something with the multiple values. And if any of those val if any of these async calls are out, we'll go down to our cache function. So yeah, really nice code. So here's another scenario. Um, say we have this user interface with pagination, where we have page one selected, the content from page one on the main UI, but this pagination at the bottom where we can go to the next page. And this all happens asynchronously. So I click on page two. It asynchronously goes and gets data from the server. Data comes back, and it uploads. It updates the UI with page two's content. That's all good and well. But what happens in this scenario? We have page one selected in pagination, page one's content in the UI. I click on page two. It goes and fires off its request. But before it com comes back, I click on page three. And then before that comes back, I click on page four. So now we have three outstanding asynchronous requests. And, and you know, it's anyone's guess what's going to happen. Maybe page two comes back, and it updates the UI with page two's content. But then maybe page four comes back. It updates the UI at page four's content, and then page three comes back and it updates the UI at page three's content. So not only have we had our UI flicker three times, which isn't good in the first place, but now we're stuck with page three's content uh, on the page, but page four selected in the pagination. So this is really bad. Uh, there's nothing we can do about it in this situation. But if we really go back to what we should have done, um, right here when we clicked onto page four, um, we know that you can programmatically reject a promise with deferred.reject. So really we could set up a situation where when we have a new API call that takes precedence over an outstanding API call that hasn't returned, we can just reject that promise so that when it comes back, the then function never fires and it never updates the page. Uh, another great example for this would be any kind of like search as you type kind of functionality, where as you're typing keystrokes, it's executing a live search. But if you type in a new keystroke, you don't want a race condition where you might get old search results uh, with new string. So you just want to cancel any outstanding promises. Quick pseudocode on how that might work. Um, we click on page one. We make a new deferred object. Um, we attach a, a listener to it that will just console.log the data. Um, and then we click on page two before page one's data has returned. Um, so we make an, a deferred object for that. But we also, when we create this, we'll reject any deferred objects that are outstanding. So we go ahead and reject um, D1, the first deferred object, uh, which is manually rejected. Now say the data for page two comes back. And this is a good UI update because uh, this is the, what the expected behavior. So that, that gets resolved. Now the data from page one comes back, and this is a bad UI update that we don't want to make, but nothing happens. Nothing is console logged because the d1.promise has been rejected. It's been manually rejected. So even though when that came back out of sync, uh, our UI isn't affected. Another thing you might want to do is chain asynchronous API calls together. So for example, we have an API service. Uh, we make one API call to it to get an API token, and then we need to use that token to hit the service again to make an API request and get our data back. So this is like kind of one API call one after another. You can chain promises together just by returning a value from the dot then function. So say we, we go to endpoint one and we get a token back. And in this scenario, we need to parse it because uh, it's in JSON and we need it as a string. So we could return json.parse token and then just chain another dot then, which now has the parse token, which we'll use to make the second API call. So we can return API service dot get data endpoint two. And then because we're returning the promise, we can then chain it together and this will be our data. And now we can do something with data. And if any of these fail, then we can just catch and handle the error. And look how nicely that kind of composes together uh, versus how, how messy that would be if you had to kind of nest callbacks in each other. Yeah, so hope that makes promises make a little bit more sense. Uh, use them everywhere in your code base. They're seriously amazing. Um, and yeah, feel free to get in touch if you've got some feedback on how this kind of format works for coding screencasts or if you've got any ideas for topics I should cover in the future. Peace.